Welcome to the Modern Enterprise Decision Makers Virtual Panel. I am Krish Subramanian, Founder and Chief Research Analyst at Vishirat Research. Vishirat Research is a boutique analyst firm focused on emerging technologies in the context of enterprises. In this series, we talk with IT decision makers from various organizations, or deciphering how they went about modernization, modernizing their IT stack, and making their IT a core part of uh, their innovation. We define modern enterprise as the organization that puts their IT as a part of core innovation team, thereby empowering their, their IT to help their developers innovate at the speed of business. Today, I'm going to talk to Nick Rockwell, CTO of the New York Times. In a way, the New York Times is a legacy organization trying to reinvent themselves in the digital era. Nick and his team are playing a key role in this transformation. It will be great to hear from Nick on their journey and possibly talk about uh, talk about how others can learn from the, their journey, the, the pitfalls they face, and uh, the success they got. Thanks, Nick, for taking your time and joining us. Uh, can you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about the mandate your team received? And uh, then we will jump into the discussion. Uh, sure. My uh, my name is Nick Rockwell. I'm the CTO at the Times. So I've been here for about two years, um, having spent the bulk of my career um, in digital media, a, a lot of it at, at established, let's say, rather than legacy media companies, um, a little bit at a couple of startups as well. Um, and, uh, you know, the mandate of my team is, is broad. I manage all the technology at the time, so both the consumer-facing product engineering as well as um, all the you know internal corporate applications and infrastructure and everything. So, um, as you said, as you put quite well, we're we're in the process of rebuilding the business to be a consumer digital business, and at the same time, I'm you know to support that rebuilding the technology organization across the board to be more user focused, more responsive, and you know more more modern and more efficient. Awesome. So in any modern enterprise, two things matter the most. One is the culture you bring in, and the second is the tools you use to sort of modernize your IT stack. So let us talk about the culture first. I read your blog post where you talked about building a culture just like building a software. That was a really interesting way to look at building a culture. Like I was pretty impressed with the, uh, how you put that uh, in comparison to developing software. So can you talk a little bit about the basic premise of the uh, post and uh, how you went about building the culture in uh, New York Times? I do see that you have also codified it a bit and eventually you are going to make it available externally. But I would love to hear from you on, the, on how you went about building the culture, what are the challenges, how you avoided the, some of these challenges, and what are the key takeaways for any other decision maker who want to go about building a culture of innovation. Uh, sure, absolutely. So, I mean, first, it's kind of funny to say this, but, but the, the approach that we've taken, which is to really demystify this idea of culture, materialize in a, you know, into documents, really, elements, all the elements that we can think of that sort of add up to the culture, and work and work on those things iteratively like that the whole approach we kind of came to accidentally um i describe it a little bit in the post but we just started to work on a couple things that seemed important and then we sort of kept going and then we wanted to keep them up to date and then we wanted to go back and revisit them because they all have dependencies on each other um and and it, it, it so or somewhere along the way we stopped and looked at what we were doing and said oh this looks a lot like software development and then that led me to think about it. Um, and, and I think you know that there are reasons why that is the case and why the techniques of software development apply. But first, I just want to start with that idea of like demystifying culture. Like we, in the business world, we sort of think of culture as like this magical element um, that you know you you can't really control, you have to handle carefully. You know, in the startup world, there's a lot of rhetoric that if you don't get the culture right, you know, day one with your first like five employees, then, you know, you'll never get it back. Um, I'm not saying that the beginning of things isn't important and, and certainly, you know, the, the 
the people that you bring into the company are going to have a massive impact on the, on the culture. But, uh, but other than that, I think it's, it's, it's taking things a little bit too far. And what we have found empirically is that, you know, if you, if you, if you demystify the idea of culture and you actually, you take all the things that you think that, that, you know, affect the culture, these are policies, they're, but they're also beliefs and values and the way that we communicate and you write them down and, and you share these, you know, you share these documents as like concrete sort of manifestations of these parts of the culture and you discuss them and you talk about them and you work on them as a team, you actually, you can change the culture. You can change it, you know, both, you create a guide that then describes the culture for everyone in the company and also people coming in, but also in the process of that, as a side effect of that process, as you debate it, you also change people's hearts and minds along the way. Now, it doesn't happen overnight, but we just think that it's important to not feel like culture is like this magical essence, um, but it is another thing that you can consciously like expose, communicate about, and work on. Yeah, I, I like the idea of like uh, thinking about changing the culture itself as a set of artifacts, like uh, where sort of write it down, make it an artifact, then sort of iterate on top of it. So where do you start? Like for example, uh, the culture, the everything is interlinked in forming the culture. So it could be the vision, it could be the set of processes you have, it could be the policies that you, are, you enforce, or it could just be the people like uh, across multiple roles. So where do you start? And if I am a large organization trying to take your approach to change the culture in my organization, where where should I be looking at? So I, you know, our experience was that it doesn't really matter. Um, and I, I support that. I think the most important thing is just to start and then to keep going <laughs> because it isn't any one thing that's going to make the difference. It's all of the things put together. So it's like, and therefore it's also important to go quite quickly. Um, if you, if you spend six months laboring over a single piece, like maybe a, you know, a value statement or a mission statement, or maybe it's something practical like a career ladder, um, that's just going to be too slow. And, and as, you know, as with software, like many smaller changes accreting over, to, over time is going to be um, a more efficient and a safer way ultimately to change the system than to try to bite off one big chunk um, and do it all at once. And you're going to realize more value along the way. So as it happens, we didn't start with any, anything big. We didn't start with a mission statement or a statement of beliefs. We started actually with a career ladder in our case. And then actually we kind of half finished that and then we quickly jumped over to talk about um, the interviewing process because that seemed to be important um, to understand how we wanted the career ladder to work. <clears throat> so we jumped around a little bit and we, we filled out a bunch of like really policies around how we, you know, thought about people's positions in the organization. Um, and then from there, we did eventually get into writing a, like a code of conduct, conduct which is mainly about communication, a beliefs and value statement, a strategy, a series of other things, um, but but that was our insight. Is like it doesn't really matter so much. Start where you see where you hear the most noise, like where the heat is the most intense, where people what seems to be getting people hung up, um, and then just like move quickly and keep going was was our lesson. Okay, uh, yeah, we talked about where, and you answered the question very nicely. Uh, but uh, let's talk a little bit about how does it have to be a top down approach or it can be a bottom up approach, especially. Uh, in a large organization with multiple teams, can a small mm -hmm. team start and sort of like take the culture across the organization, or does it require a support, uh, executive level support, and or it should be mandated down? Which works better? Like, do you have any take on that? I think I think we can take slightly different approaches for different um, parts, basically. So most of what we did, most of what I've described so far you know, the we that I'm using was me and my team of direct reports, a relatively small group of people, about 10 of us. Um, what we did do is we, we worked on these documents and we got them to where we liked them. And then, you know, the first time I think we just threw it out to the whole team, which is a big team, about 500 people. Um, and we just didn't get that much feedback back because in, in that situation, senior manager is throwing something out there to everyone. You're not going to get a lot of great feedback. So somewhere along the way, we, we set up this idea of, a, of a, a sounding board, which is kind of half a pun, but we wanted a group of people that we thought were representative to get feedback from 
kind of before we launched something out to the rest of the world. And it was sort of a way to test our ideas. So we set up a group of about 30 um, people. We, we sort of nominated and handpicked from around the organization at different levels, different teams. One, and, you know, all people that we thought were influential um, and, you know, whose perspective we valued. And we started giving them a crack. We would work on a document that we thought it was like 80% we'd share it with them and let them work on it for a week or two. Um, and then when, when, you know, they thought it was ready, then we'd send it out to the rest of the team. And that sort of approach of concentric circles, I think has worked really well for us. Um, it, not only has it, we've got more feedback and, and it produced a better result. It's also sort of seeded the team with a bunch of people who've already thought about this particular issue a fair amount. So when we send it out to everyone else, there's more people that they can ask questions of who can help kind of explain what we're doing, what the intent is. So that's worked quite well. In a few other cases, we really have taken a bottoms up approach. So we also did team charters as part of this process and actually started to also institute OKRs. Um, that we did completely in a bottoms up way, which certainly in the case of OKRs is not always the way that is recommended, but it's what worked for us. So I think to some degree we've tried different approaches, but that central idea of like having a couple of concentric circles, starting with a smaller group so you can just easier to work with, expanding to a larger group and then expanding out to the whole team has worked quite well. Yeah, I, I also read in your post that uh, in, in case where it was difficult for you to get direct feedback, you use some sort of a survey to get some feedback and uh, get some signals. So like um, uh, keeping that anonymity sort of helps to enable that, uh, kind of a feedback loop, but how do you sustain that uh, feedback continuously? So the, do people become more open after they start with the survey? Probably they realize that, okay, there is some action that's going on. Probably the, they can speak up for uh, what they think is right and stuff like that. Does it uh, eventually lead to this kind of a culture where people are confident that they have the mandate to speak what they have in their mind? without uh, sort of worrying about uh, any consequence that could come uh, come uh, come to them. Uh, did you really uh, learn anything there? Yeah, I think so. I mean, that, that's the benefit of using surveys. Now, clearly, we try to get feedback all kinds of ways, and like from, you know, structured to unstructured. Um, but the specific advantage of using a survey is that it can be anonymous. So, um, and I do think that that's helpful, uh, absolutely, because even if, people, you know, ideally you don't want people to feel like they have to be anonymous. You'd prefer for everyone to be comfortable. We put a lot of effort into creating an environment that feels safe for people to offer their ideas and that feels transparent anyway. But I think just having that anonymous channel um, actually reinforces that message. It, it says very clearly, we want to hear from you whether or not you're comfortable being identified. So almost more than the actual feedback we've gotten through those surveys there just the fact that they exist and that there's a way we're, we're, we're supporting communication in that way has been quite helpful okay. awesome so the, before we move into tools one last question to you on the culture part is you have already sort of like uh, codified uh, the set of things uh, some uh, some organization can do in your blog post so can you talk a little bit about it and also can you talk about some of the pitfalls people should be aware of as they go about taking the same method of like uh, creating artifacts, collaborating, and then enabling the feedback? So like, uh, what are the pitfalls that, could, that they should look out for? Yeah. yeah. So I, th I think the biggest pitfall is that one of the reasons companies don't like to write a lot of stuff down, or when they do, they want to, they, you know, we generally like to do it very slowly and very carefully and have it be a very like thin layer of very senior people is that it is a little scary um, when you make a lot of statements about you know what you believe and you run the risk of alienating someone or making some mistake or you know uh, there's, there's risk in doing that so I think that's in many ways the biggest inhibitor often there will be some other department whether it's a human resources department or some team that gets wind of what you're doing and doesn't like, doesn't like it or that wants to review everything before it goes out. So that I think, but that really will, will, um, will really create so much drag on the process that it basically won't work. So I think having that courage to like start a real like open-ended conversation with the team and be prepared to hear things you don't want to hear, um, that's really important. Uh, 
So I would say like fight through that discomfort because um, it is, it's worth it. And, you know, even if the parts that you don't want to hear, like those are the things that you do need to hear. So <laughs> um, right. I would offer encouragement to all who, who do attempt it. <laughs> do you have any metrics to measure the success of your uh, approach? Or, or do you suggest any metrics for people who want to measure whether it's working or not? Like uh, how do they find if something they have put, uh, put together is working for them or not? Yeah, the, the, I mean, again, surveys tend to be the best, the best metric per se. So that's the other advantage of surveys is that they're fairly quantifiable and you can ask the same questions over and over again. So we do that at a company level, actually. We have a, an annual survey across the whole company. Um, and again, like we weren't even really thinking about this when we started the process, but we saw clear results in the company survey within just our team. Um, we had a 20 point jump from the previous survey in uh, people's perception of career development in the company. So that was a direct result of like the work that we put into these policies, but I also believe into the, like the whole effort and the communication around that work um, and the transparency that we were creating. We had a big jump in our uh, perception of diversity and inclusion as well. Um, and also like significant jumps in like the perception of trust and management and a bunch of other factors. So um, that's like, that's where we've looked to get like, you know, quantitative support metrics and, and feedback. And that's been very validating. So let's now shift gears and uh, move from culture to the other part, which is plat tools and platforms. So uh, I've uh, read some of your uh, posts. And uh, in fact, uh, when I read your post, like I uh, started smiling because I was one of the early advocates for platform as a service in the mm -hmm. early days, 2009, circa 2009. Like I thought like I, if cloud is about abstracting away the com complexity and making it easily, why should we just stop with the infrastructure? Why can't we just abstract away the complexity with all the middleware, runtimes, everything, and make it uh, give her the API to which developers can push. So uh, that's, uh, that was the reason why I was advocating uh, platform as a service. And eventually, I even ran a couple of conference calls, uh, DeployCon, to sort of uh, make uh, PaaS much more uh, visible to the enterprise customers. So from that point of view, I completely agree with the, the, what you're saying in terms of taking that up serverless abstraction and uh, talking about it. So uh, before we dig a little deeper on that, I would love to get a feel for how big is your IT team and uh, what is the, if you can talk about what is, what is the kind of environment you have, uh, the IT stack you have so that we can set some context and then talk about serverless uh, and go uh, deeper on that. Sure. So, I mean, I have a fairly large team, I would consider, for the you know, size of the company and the industry that we're in. Um, you know, I, when I think about serverless, I'm mainly thinking about our customer-facing product engineering for the simple reason that, uh, you know, like many companies, most of our corporate applications are third-party applications of some kind. And those are not yet being created to run on serverless platforms. So that's like not really an option. Um, so on the product engineering side, we have somewhere at any given time between 225, 200 and 225 engineers. Um, and, you know, we have a strong engineering culture. Like we are, we are not afraid of doing software development. We do a lot of our own engineering, um, which I think is also an, like a necessity when we're talking about serverless at this point in time. I mean, the platforms are there. You really have to target them and write custom applications. You can't run again, third party stuff, you can use you know, open source framework sometimes, but in many cases you'll substitute like platform managed services for open source products. But well, I guess my point ultimately is like, I don't view serverless as a way to not have developers or to you know, not have to invest in having a strong engineering team. I actually think it's the opposite. It's more like you actually have to invest in a strong engineering team, but if you do, you're gonna get a lot more leverage out of that investment. So that's our, like, that's our approach. Like we have a strong engineering culture. I only want to make that stronger. Um, and serverless is a, is a way to get, again, like to focus and maximize the, the impact of that team. Yeah, I think I, I, I could fully, fully agree with that. Even while talking about PaaS. In fact, I was uh, also working with in Red Hat's OpenShift team. Uh, so I was uh, part of the team for some time. So mm -hmm. while talking about PaaS, I, I always said it's not going to take away the operations or even make uh, 
developers less relevant it's about letting developers operate at a scale which they could or be more productive which they yeah. couldn't in the past because of all the unnecessary distractions that came on the way in terms of dealing with it and all that so I, from that the perspective i completely agree with the, your definition of so mm -hmm. from uh, where do you see everything going do you expect uh, infrastructure to play a role at all in the kind of world you are visualizing or do, uh, do you think infrastructure will be relevant what matters more or the developer focused services and uh, th that's what is going to uh, make uh, companies more innovative so what is uh, what is your take on that i i do think this is like another step in the devops evolution where you know you do see engineers let's say you know, software engineers sort of consuming more and more of what happened in the infrastructure or ops world so i i do think that's the case and there's no there's no getting around the fact that serverless the serverless dream is like close to the no-op stream and that it's really is abstracting away a lot of what we've called infrastructure or ops. Um, and it, it's not that nobody's doing it, it's just that it's being, I think of it as being industrialized. So it's now being done by brilliant ops and infrastructure people at the platforms at Google, at AWS, at, at Microsoft at an industrial scale. Um, so like there's still, there, you know, that whole discipline actually gets much more interesting as well because it's really tackling the hard problems. Um, it's just being done in a handful of places, not sort of in a cottage industry way at every company by a handful of people. So um, it is very much like the industrialization rather than the elimination of, of infrastructure or ops. Yeah, uh, yeah, that definitely makes sense to me. And uh, as you go about uh, build, building this culture, do you have to change the tools dramatically to sort of make it uh, easy for the culture to interplay with the set of tools or uh, uh, or like uh, you help, help seep this culture into existing set of tools so that there is not, not much of training involved for the um, uh, engineers. So how, how did you go about doing it? I, I think the tools change radically and not only the tools, frankly, but the whole approach to engineering and development, it changes a lot. There's no getting around that. And I think you know, the, the gist of my post was like, why aren't more people as excited about serverless as I am? <laughs> you know, like, and why are we talking about containers? It's, you know, um, and the, but that's one of the reasons why is like, it is a big discontinuity and you do have to change a lot and you have to sort of conform to the constraints of the platform that you're targeting. So, you know, that's hard and that takes work and that there's risk and a lot of the platforms are quite early. So, you know, but it doesn't always look so attractive, but my premise is that the, the rewards on the other side of that journey are profound and extreme and, and absolutely worth it. But, but yeah, it's a, it's a big shift in tooling and approach and what we think about architecture. Frankly, engineers have to let go of a lot of things that they, that they did in the past and trust the platform in a way that they're not always comfortable doing. So it is also like being comfortable with like a narrower kind of scope. Um, and, and a perceived, if not actual, loss of control that goes along with that. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, there are tons of things I can talk with you, but I think we are running out of time, and uh, we will come back again in the future and discuss more about uh, these topics. Uh, okay. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for your time. It was a great conversation, or uh, it was a great beginning of a conversation, and I hope uh, our listeners will love to come back and listen to you talk about these topics. And uh, uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.